Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the phenomenon of creating a strong spirit. Now, this is really kind of quite odd to talk about because for me previously, the co concept of spirit or the idea of strong spirit or anything like that, um, apart from maybe in the realm of let's say business or something like that when you when you would say someone in business has a strong spirit it's not really applicable to to real life in, in a sense i've always thought that i've always thought well it's not really something that's that's particularly within reality um i remember my mum used to say um whenever my nana had gone into hospital um she used to say to me, oh, your nana's got a really strong spirit. Uh, she'll make it through. And numerous times she did. Uh, and she made it to the age of 96. And um, I always thought to myself, well, yeah, you know, maybe there's some nugget of truth in that, that, you know, there's someone has a strong spirit or whatever. But I never really understood fully what it meant. And I was always intrigued by it as a concept. I was always thought, well, it's quite interesting. Um, then when I started reading Jung about four years ago, um, the ideas naturally as, as anyone with my kind of trait structure and my kind of um, predispositions and, and even my kind of socialization, um, uh, it lends itself to being excited by the concepts and you know you you see these concepts like shadow animo animus persona etc and uh, they seem to fit with reality and they seem to fit uh, with what you can perceive um but i kind of dismissed this idea of spirit soul as in spirit being the anima soul being the anima and kind of focused more on the dichotomy of male and female, masculine and feminine, and took the anima and animus as being feminine and masculine, respectively. And um, it wasn't really until maybe a year or so in that I really started to grasp the some of the grounding, some of the reality of the anima and animus being soul and spirit. Um, now, the weirdest thing is that the spirit and the soul and the body, like in Christianity, you know, that sort of triangle, or that triad, um, it does exist, and it is, it is real in reality, but, um, obviously the way it's talked about in Christianity, or the way it's kind of marketed in Christianity, is, um, you know, it, it it lends itself to an obscurantism or something like that where, you know, people get turned off by it. People get kind of, um, they feel as if it's uh, just mystical or magical or isn't there. But of course, there was really, for me at least, there was a turning point with, with Schopenhauer, with his will and idea, which basically are, as I've talked about before, spirit and soul, and the manifestation of that within the soma, the body being a vessel. And it was really through that, and this was maybe actually about two years in, but previously I had start, started to understand the phenomenological setting of the spirit and soul with regards to the dichotomy of masculine feminine. And I could see that more psychologically, you know, at the year mark. But at the two-year mark really started to understand with Schopenhauer's philosophy, I understand where this fits now and where it is actually, one could say, a scientific reality, not merely um, a spiritual reality or even a psychological or, or phenomenological reality. It's a, it, In my eyes, at least, it's a scientific reality. Maybe a lot of people would argue on me with that and actually say I'm better saying it's a philosophical reality. In fact, I would agree and prob probably am better saying it's a philosophical reality. But nonetheless, 
if we were to study Schopenhauerian philosophy in a scientific manner, we would see that the concept of will and idea is is massively applicable in a scientific way. Um, and it seems to me that the objective formulation of um, will and idea um, comes about in humanity in the in the subjective domain of, of consciousness and living creatures as um, affect as emotion um, and and if you remove consciousness or if you remove living matter the will and the idea are merely objective or well they're not really objective because even chemical reactions are, are subjective in the sense of they are imperfect uh, whereas objective as a word always kind of makes you think of perfection of things being neatly squared and all the rest of it but even in the in the objective in the in the world of non-living phenomena shall we say uh, it's subjective but for the purposes of this I'll say it's objective and it's a uh, it, it's not colored with an affect so chemical reactions, which are the will and the idea, the, the active principle, the yang, and the um, passive principle, the yin, uh, when you take different ke chemical reactions, um, you can see that one of them is an active process, one of them's one of them's a formulation of the active process, one is just the passive. Um, and then, obviously, the way in which I learned that this colours itself as... Jung would put it, the soul of the world, when consciousness arises and when there are actual living beings with, with bodies that, that have actual sensations and pains and emotions and all that. It, it, the link really is in the sodium and potassium reactions in the brain, with one being a more active chemical, one being a more passive, and the formulation of that in a... Um, an action potential that creates the affective uh, domain, basically. And we can see how, basically, evolution is an affective process with regards to living, living organisms because even the most instinctive brains, even that kind of lizard brain, let's say, that kind of... Um, free-tiered process or free-tiered brain that everyone loves to draw upon, uh, you know, the lizard brain, the, the mammalian brain, and then the, the kind of the extended neocortex um, with regards to humans specifically. Um, even in that, we see an affective basis because even in that basic lizard brain, there is instincts, and the instincts are, to a degree, to an either greater degree or a lesser degree, affective than the mammalian brain with the limbic system obviously no one's going to doubt that's not emotional because it's all to do with emotions uh, memories and things like that and um, and then with the neocortex we get this development of, of rational thought placed on top of that where we seem to get a, a non-dualist formulation of emotion and rationale in a kind of combination it's very very weird um, in which even seemingly the most objective thought has behind it, if, and this you have to look very, very closely inside yourself to start to see this, has some sort of minor emotional charge to it, some sort of minor formulation of emotion. Um, and, and naturally, you, would, you could argue that that comes from the, the lower developments of the brain, that of course the neocortex is built upon and there's loads of different kind of theories for um, supporting this affective view, uh, affective view, this emotional view. Um, one of my favourite theories in terms of the, the generation of consciousness or the development of consciousness is uh, Antonio DiMaggio's um, uh, structure. I really enjoy that structure and I really think that that works marvellously and I think it works marvellously as well when you integrate it with a Jungian view. Um, and so that's particularly something that, that's quite interesting. But getting back to this kind of spirit-soul dichotomy, when 
we have the will and the idea as I say, in these chemical reactions, in the ob objective world, you know, in quotes, because it's not really objective, we just label it as such and then dissect it scientifically in an objective manner. Um, but actually, the objective, it seems to me at least, and I've not done too much thinking about this, so, you know, I might be wrong and that's fine, but it seems to me that the um, this objectification of the world is merely a... A superficial product or it's kind of like a a product of we don't even need to use the word superficial but a product of the rationale the the, the enlargement of the neocortex so that then we kind of objectify the world more instead of subjectify it it's almost as if the objective in evolutionary terms has flowered out of this subjective basis but nonetheless this subjective basis remains still in place so it kind of feels to me almost as if um, this objective rational formulations, although definitely because in the evolutionary history of mankind, it, it, it has come about naturally, the, the development of the, the intellect and abstract thought and executive function in the prefrontal cortex. It still seems to me that what we're trying to do possibly as a product of that develop well yes as a product of that development is make the world objective more and that's quite ironic if you think about it because it's nature that has done that to itself so you see nature as a subjective basis has created something that objectifies its subjective self in the sense that it subject it objectifies the, the natural world, which was itself inherently subjective um, by way of intelligence, but, but then it seems to get a disconnect, a disconnect happens. And this is what we're seeing now in the fact that we're far too objective, we're far too rational, we're far too intellectual for our own good, and we slip up because we've got an element of rational control, and so we, we, we make climate disasters, we make moral uh, decisions wrong and this is what Nietzsche talked about with the ideas of, of let's say moral decadence because um, you know he talks about Socrates in this way they create these rational formulations um, instead of which are kind of on top of the instincts and, and in a way of course especially in a Jungian view that would be within the instincts within the wise old man archetype or the, the, the intellectual instincts basically um, uh, but in Nietzsche's view, Nietzsche's a little bit aside from Jung really here because Nietzsche says, well no, that kind of decadent formulation of what you believe morality should be is actually a kind of slight deviation from the instincts even though it is partially living within them it's a slight deviation and it's actually a, a deviation maybe Nietzsche wouldn't quite use these terms but for me it seems at least, although he might do it's almost a deviation of hubris, uh, and Nietzsche might have used similar words, if I, if I remember correctly, and uh, specifically like Twilight of the Idol and stuff like that, or maybe if he didn't, he alluded to those sorts of things at least, um, and, and he, even in saying that uh, Socrates is a decadent, he's, he's saying that a little bit, and instead of that, what Nietzsche thought was, allow the kind of natural instinctive morality that comes up out of the psyche out of the out of the, our, our instinctive truth let's say and um uh, and that's obviously his kind of dionysian view essentially um so there is a bit of this kind of like objective uh cloaking of, of trying to put these objectifications on the world uh in in what nietzsche's saying um uh, but if we are to kind of see that this will and idea formulate itself um, are objective fundamentally, you can even say this in um, uh, the will and the idea in, um, you know, the formulation of planets and all these kind of different things, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You could say on a mac macrocosmic scale, the Big Bang, you know, the will, there was a, a new, uh, there was a, what does Schopenhauer call it? The blind, uh, the word for blind, noumenal, is it noumenal? I think it's noumenal will. And um, and then the idea. Now, of course, it can't be that that Big Bang, the products that 
were created at the expansion as well, right at that literally billion for a billion for a billion for 10 billion for a 10 billion for a 10 billion for whatever it was of a second with that expansion. Um, um, you can't say there wasn't an idea there. There's an idea in the fact that there is phenomenon. So there is the will and the idea. The will going to produce the, the, the idea as cemented within the universe, which as I've talked about before, is what Jung talked about. Obviously not in that, that more phys physics manner or cosm cosmological manner, but uh, that's what he talked about as the soul being trapped in matter. The idea, the anima, being trapped in matter on an objective plane first off and then uh, or, or what we would term in our with our rational mind as an objective plane um, uh, but then when when it got to humans the the will and the idea the this active and passive became um, manifest um, uh, and the soul was trapped in matter in the subjective sense in the emotional the affect sense um, and so, of course, and, and the man being genetically the spirit and the woman being genetically the soul. And you see this, really, and, and I want to try and provide a, a, just a simple idea for this. Because, yes, OK, we could get into um, hormones, hormonal differences, uh, instinctive differences between men and women and all that sort of stuff. The neurological differences between men and women. I am firmly set now, um, and I've mentioned this many times before, even a year ago, but I'm even more firmly set now in the fact that there are definite differences between men and women. And you see, this is slowly becoming a less popular view, but I don't understand why. Because you see, it seems completely child childlike, this, this knowledge. Um, you look at a woman and you look at a man, they are different, they are sex sexually dimorphic, um, they have sexual dimorphism, and so obviously you, you, you know that they're going to be different in psychology, if they're different so, uh, in the soma, in the body, um, then, then of course they're going to be different psychologically, that's absolutely child's play, yet people are... I mean, even just from a philosophical, you know, logical point of view, you know, using using good old philosophical logic, it's obvious. But but yet people determ are determined to create this kind of fallacy, and I would call it a fallacy, that there are no differences between men and women psychologically. It's it's an absolute fallacy, basically formulated from nothing, formulated from a desire. A subjective desire from their own schema on the world, and of course, I have my own schema as well, and that's um, that'll be coloured in a certain way. So I'd, I'd quite happily own up to that. That I, my cognitive structure, or or my kind of uh, even like down to my heuristics, down to my thinking, down to everything um, based on my experiences, is structured to to want to behave and, and believe a certain thing and so of course my behavior um, is subjective in that manner but nonetheless from what I can see it seems uh, absolutely ridiculous and it seems ridiculous because for one um, uh, not only are of course the observable physical differences just in the, the literally um, the size of the bodies and all the rest of it and the de genitalia and all that sort of stuff but there's things like the maternal instinct whereas men don't have a maternal instinct you could say they have some sort of paternal instinct for sure and does that char characterize itself as protection maybe assertion and things like that yes whereas the maternal instinct is totally different it's nurturing it's it's uh, assertive in a different way it's it's what you would term possessive not not assertive in a dominant i'm going to kill this person as a man would to protect his child but it's possessive in a, almost you could say a more harrowing sense because a woman would do more than a man to protect her child you see um and so you look at it from an instinctive basis and you think well that of course creates different behaviors in in men men and women 
you look at it from an uh, from a hormonal basis, and of course, there's things there as well. Um, there's also um, things like uh, the menstrual cycle that colour uh, women's emotions more frequently on a quite frequent basis. Obviously, give or take twelve times a year, and they are emotional for possibly even a period of a week or so, um, whereas men don't have that. So this is the thing that Jung talked about, about how women are slightly more emotional, they're more the soul, and the men are slightly more logical and thinkers, and they're the spirit. Um, and, and the spirit and the soul are slightly aside from just thinking and feeling, but, but they are integrated within it as well, or part of it. Um, so it, it's absolutely ridiculous to say otherwise. Now, I don't want to get into dogmatic, black or white, psych, psychic splitting territory here. Yes, of course, there can be women who are not really that maternal. Yes, of course, there can be men that are uh, more emotional. And it's a, it's a huge, massive, fine spectrum. The problem with Jung is that we do get into this kind of territory of uh, blind opposites, where everything's very, very opposed to one another, and everything's, well, all people are this and all people are that. It's not at all the case, and, and Jung didn't even really think about it in that. However, it, it gets labelled like that because, of course, it's easier for people to say, well, this is how Jung thought in these terms of, like, strict opposites, but it's not at all. Um, and there can be many men who um, have slightly more of an anima, there can be many women who have slightly more animus, and that you wouldn't believe the the beautiful rainbow spectrum of how the archetypes come at, come about come out in people. Not only the anima and animus, but even like different sides of the anima and animus. For example, the the wise old woman, the wise old man, and how these come out in in, in even the opposite sexes as well. Um, so some men portraying the wise old woman, some women portraying the wise old man, and uh, some women being more anonymous and animate all this. Some people being uh, more, you know, having that trickster archetype, that eccentricity within them, all these different things. Some people being slightly more childish or whatever, all the different ways in which it could be coloured. Some people being more heroic than others. Again, that's kind of like a subset of the animus, essentially, or the, the, the really strong, developed animus. Uh, and again, that can be in both men and women. It doesn't have to just be in men. So it's not a blind, psychic split of opposites that is just black and white and that that, 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 is, that is almost kind of like very, very, almost horribly traditionalist. Um, in a sense, Jung didn't explore, and I think this is just because the fact of, of it's really come about after his time, but then again, he did explore it to a degree with regards to uh, gay men, and etc., and he says that in, I think it's Archetypes in the Collective Unconscious. Um, he says it in a very black and white manner that needs updating um, in that particular section when he talks about it. Um, um, but he didn't like explore fully sexuality and and gender and all that sort of stuff that that comes about as a product of a certain individualized archetypal arrangement from um, in most part socialization, although he could never be aware of the degree to which it would be genetic. And I do believe, well, of course. There, there is a genetic component with it. I mean, everything in Jungian psychology, when we're talking of Jungian psychology, there's a genetic component in it. Um, but um, so there will be a predefined genetic archetypal component to it. But more so, it, a lot of it is down to socialization and the way in which the archetypes individualize themselves or individuate themselves in that particular psyche um, with regards to gender, sexuality, etc. Particularly with these newfound conceptions of gender that are socially and behaviourally reinforced that then lend themselves to propagate themselves like a kind of Richard Dawkins meme, basically, um, in the psyches of more people, then leading people to be more neurotic because they're questioning their base uh, genetic expression and who they are by way of the herd instinct and going along with different now socially deemed acceptable forms of gender, sexuality, behaviour, etc. This is not me saying that people do not have a certain uh, proper, full 
sexuality and that can be any certain sexuality it can be bisexual um gay lesbian whatever heterosexual whatever um because that is the case but um and that actually can represent quite a large portion of individuals as a genuine function within them um and me being practically you know if i had to label it bisexual myself you know it's uh, it's something that i've had battles with myself and i'm not being unsympathetic to that expression i'm just trying to be quite logical and understanding with regards to the psychological phenomena behind it um so what this means is that we we are integrated into a world where certain people are have a certain sexuality not because it's their let's say their proper sexuality but because uh they've been behaviorally and socially reinforced into it and they've got that kind of these childish neurotic symptoms building because of the the lack of understanding of their own psyches and their own their own place in the world sexually and in other forms as well from whatever other complexes they may have built up over childhood um and uh, so really what we need to do is we need to approach these people psychologically and really get to understand their psyche, get them to understand their psyche, then they can integrate properly as their, their proper sexuality, shall we say, which might be lesbian, it might be gay, it might be bisexual, or it might be heterosexual or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, all the other formulations of sexuality are basically just different off branches of those kind of things anyway so that's why i'm just kind of referring to those in particular the other branches of sexuality are more kind of con subjective conceptual distinctions on those primary uh, categories and they're more so um in the realm of, of thoughts and ideas rather than let's say um cemented in a, in a in a really holistic manner but Nonetheless, someone could call themselves pansexual or, or demisexual or whatever, um, and it still have uh, a level of mental representation and therefore a, a le level of behavioural representation in their life. Um, uh, but nonetheless, um, this is what we kind of formulate. And this all comes about as well, or it maybe not comes about, but is reinforced by this kind of um, idea of this fallacy of the fact that men and women do not have biological and psychological differences as soon as that's taken out what we get is this very Taoist conception of um one makes two two makes three out of the three come the ten thousand things which is to say that first we had let's say one sexuality or two sexualities now we have you know 20 or 30 and as the complexity of the Tao um, if we're talking in those terms, increases, so does this kind of like um, negativity and this kind of Kali Yuga, as if we want to put it in, in, in Hindu terms, which is what we're living in right now. And the over-complexity, the over-consumerism, the, the, the off-kilter world of climate change and all these different things, these disasters, this is um, the... Uh, what the Hindus call the you know the Kali Yuga, what the Lakota um, Indians and people like that have talked about with regards to to different prophecies coming about, uh, spelling doom for humanity and things that are going to go wrong. These are all these things, and it comes out um, uh, in a very actually quite human manner, not a mystical or religious or divine manner in any sense. It's just the the human patterning of an archetypal experience and the archetypal experience basically being the end of the world, the apocalypse. That's the archetypal experience that is overlaid or, or even underlaid um, in our society right now. And we all know it, whether some people are unconscious of it and so, or some people are conscious of it, but that's what's happening. And, and it's basically been foreshadowed or predicted or prophesied by all these different religions in the world, but in mystical language, because all of the prophets that prophesied this um, were possessed by archetypal forms when we were, of course, writing these prophecies. And we all know the archetypes like to speak in very weird, fancy, odd language. And so then it gets interpreted as religious or spiritual when actually it's not specifically that. It's actually archetypal and it's an archetypal 
per projection into the future of what a, a kind of human um a man-made apocalypse will will end up being and it's all these things combined it's the, the over complexity the the um kind of this gender expression this sexuality expression this consumerism all of these things have one fundamental link which is um uh, which is over complexity and we all know what happens to the universe as well when it gets over complex what happens is the the universe starts off as um, a small thing that has a lot of energy bundle of energy and then it starts to go more spread out more and more spread out more and more complex more and more things further from one another more and more dark energy built up more and more space between things um uh, more and more just uh, random stars and etc and all that sort of stuff and then it pittles out and that's what happens as well here we started off as this kind of more ordered thing at the start of the universe it was more ordered at the end of the universe it was more chaotic and more spread out and all the rest of it we've started off as a as humanity as a more ordered thing and then we've gone more and more chaotic more and more disordered more and more complexity which spells the the end you see it because we are always a microcosmic representation of the whole um and the the levels in which i could get into that are infinitely complex especially if we're talking about um like a quantum universe or a quantum multiverse um and all those sorts of things but I actually have to go and do a test now for university, a little exam. So I'm going to be back and uh, I will continue this after I've done the exam. And uh, um, we'll kind of get back on to uh, the spirit as well and the kind of implications of that and the implications of creating a strong spirit um, and, and how that can serve you well psychologically, how it can serve you well in the world. And I'll also touch upon kind of minor, let's say, alchemical or religious stuff with regards to that, because, of course, that has to be touched upon um, if we're going to be talking about kind of this cultivation of the spirit. Um, but, yeah, that was just kind of a, a little uh, um, expose, I suppose, or kind of just little um, talk um about some of these fundamental things that are happening in society from a psychological viewpoint, from an under underlying psychological viewpoint, and that are actually um, affecting, pushing through in, in collective ways, in big ways, um, into the world uh, in a negative manner at the moment. Um, uh, and it's really, it's kind of like a, a collective trickster as well that's kind of playing on the world stage at the moment. Um, with regards to these things, um, because the trickster uh, seems to be um, reinforcing itself within all of these com uh, complex patterns and uh, um, spelling the, the doom of the world slowly, essentially. And uh, you could say there's kind of like trickster-like gods out there, of course, that that represent this from a, like a, you know, an archetypal figure or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and certainly the, the negative side of the feminine, like that Kali, of course, in the Kali Yuga, and, and um, uh, you know, at the end of the universe, it's said that Kali um, will stand on the body of Shiva and all the rest of it, and uh, she'll be the one to finally finish off the world. And, of course, the negative aspect of the feminine is massively the negative aspect of the anima is massively coming into our society right now with regards to our um massively dogmatic relationships and complex and when i say complex relationships i mean complexes in a complex in the unconscious collective complexes in the unconscious tying themselves dogmatically to certain ideas of liberty and stuff like that freedom of expression and, and uh, freedom of choice and all this sort of stuff that is uh, although there's a positive side to that we are becoming more neurotic with those sorts of choices and uh, that is the negative side of this kind of archetypal femininity this possessiveness as well uh, that that comes in and, and drives us forward and I mean, I've not even mentioned the, the negative formulations of AI, of artificial intelligence, if it were to ever come in in any full manner, because we're projecting all sorts of um, God ideas at, at 
AI and technology um, that, that could see very, very bad psychological effects and even, you know, worldly effects come from that technology um, with regards to, you know, this kind of human submission to technology, not in the way of like iRobot or anything like that, but in the way of laziness and in the way of um, kind of incompetence and stuff. And we rely on robots more and more and more until we're just vegetables, basically, and all the rest of it. Like in Wally, -E. Wally -E is a better example of how it could turn out with the uh, sunbeds, you know, and all that sort of stuff, rather than uh, iRobot. iRobot, I don't think. It could come a bit, but not really. I think more so it's Wally -E is the movie to watch. And that Wally -E is a movie and a, a fantasy. The, the movie was created by someone writing a, a script, which is a fantasy direct from the unconscious. I've talked about this before. And so that is an archetypal projection moving forward of what the future could be. Because that fantasy is like an active imagination, you see. And that, that actually can have a prospective function, a future prophetic function like dreams can so this is why we can see in these collective uh, big collective movies that everyone likes and gets on board with these can actually have in some circumstances not all at all but in some they can have a future projection and that's what's partially going to come true but in a different way not in the exact same way because it never happens in that way with regards to future dreams anyway we'll have to get off now and i'll be back in a short while so, I am back from doing my exam. Uh, don't ask me how I did, I've not got my results yet, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we get it pretty quick because uh, on the site we use, like kind of our intranet system for the university, we do it in a lot of the questions are multiple choice, so a lot of the exams are entirely multiple choice. And so basically the computer system works out your mark straight away and spits it back out at you. But sometimes the teachers, the lecturers, uh, don't allow you to see that mark straight away. Sometimes it's 24 hours, or sometimes it can be a few weeks, depending on the exam. Um, so we will just see, but I feel pretty confident in it. It didn't seem like too hard an exam. In fact, uh, I'm really starting to get to like this lecturer because she seems to uh, word the questions quite nicely. Some lecturers kind of have a habit of wording the questions in sneaky little ways, um, that me and, you know, were a little bit tougher, but nonetheless, that was okay. So, uh, obviously I was talking about all sorts of anima, animus stuff, of course, like, um, uh, more collective variations in society in terms of what's going on right now and how, um, things are starting to play out on the world stage in terms of this kind of apocalyptic type archetypal theme that's going on that many people who've looked into our uh, Jungian psychology will start to pick up on, start to be aware of, um, especially when you start to track the anima in the form of Chopinian philosophy as, as the idea um, over the course of, I don't want to say the Christian era because you don't have to go that far back, you don't have to go to the first century AD or anything, but around the time of the Renaissance. And if you overlap that with astrological thought, like I've talked about in the past, um, and so you overlap the investment of the idea, the emotionally charged, the affective idea, um, into uh, the, the work of the Renaissance in the Latin translations of the text and all that and the, the philosophical work going on there and then leading up to the scientific revolution of sort of like the 1600s and, and from there and then the uh, kind of the slow destruction um, or decaying of the Christian kind of tradition or message or whatever, um, then you what you start to see is you start to see this very, very scary picture um, that is basically come into a head with uh, incredible advances in technology and all this sort of stuff like I described in the previous part of the video. It's, it's very, very hard to explain. It's easier to write about in a book and I've wrote about it in a book and I've gone into some depth because you can understand it more when you're reading it than, than me, let's say, talking about it and trying to uh, remember all of the complexity of the different things that that I've uh, 
thought of, that I've understood, that I've been aware of philosophically and and uh, from these kind of macro cultural shifts, shall we say. Um, but, it, you know, anyone who's interested in Jungian psychology will know about this, will, will be aware of these kind of changes. They may have got to it in a different way than me. They may not have gone down... Um, quite the same route or understood it in quite the same way as me um but the way i got to it as i say was understanding the the link between Chopinian concepts and the animo and the animus and then projecting that back as a psychological reality through the centuries and trying to find the kind of the collective etiology of um any of these macro cultural shifts that have kind of come in at the same time as the astrologers predict predicted um with regards to, the, to their uh, i think they call them decants or something like that um and it's very very interesting that the precision with which these things have come in the, the renaissance was very very close to these astrological predictions um with regards to the age of pisces i believe and then of course the age of aquarius coming or or well, you know what it's like with some people saying, some astrologers or non-astrologers saying, well, we're already in the age of Aquarius, we entered it in like 1967, or we entered it in 2001, or we entered it in this year, and then others saying, well, actually, it's around 2150 that we're coming into that age. But of course, right at the moment, being, from an astrological point of view at least, being at the... Um, stage of, of just the final final part of the age of pisces if we're going to take this 2100 we've got this natural huge battle between science and religion coming in um which certainly has extended the last hundred years or so and will continue to extend and this kind of powers of of pisces and aquarius fighting um uh for that kind of um superiority and Pisces representing religion, Aquarius represented science, but of course from an astrological perspective, um, doesn't really matter whether you believe in astrology by the way, um, because astro what astrology is doing is it m merely it's predicting a, uh, a human macro, you know, collective cultural shift that has actually occurred. So it doesn't really matter whether you believe about the planets or anything that, like that, I'm not so big into that, but what matters is the fact that, hang on, this thing that was said to prophesize these things has actually prophesized them in a kind of, you know, fair way. Not, I, I wouldn't, I was going to say a loose way, but I don't actually think I would say a loose way. I think it's done it in quite a fair way. Um, it's just that, you see, we tend to think in our scientific, you know, 21st century scientific manner we project all of these metamagical feelings onto religion. Religion is, uh, or, or these kind of, you know, astrology, things like that, it isn't metamagical, it isn't magical in the sense of underneath it, esoterically. Esoterically, uh, or if you understand it psychologically, it's not magical, it's just psychology, it's just... Uh, it, it purely coming from the psyche, the human psyche, and the, the different dynamics and the different processes that the psyche can manifest itself through human experience. And yes, it is true that the psyche can manifest it through human experience as prophesizing and as being able to understand the future as a function of the evolutionary development of the intuitive function within us. Um, and I mean, obviously other animals have intuition and things like that as well developed. Um, but for us, it's at a more higher intellectual level. And uh, and that is a part of this perspective function as well. It's kind of in encapsulated partially within it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's very, very interesting, all that sort of stuff. But getting back to the spirit, getting back to the soul, getting back to, you know, the the animus and the anima, and this, this animus being the, the man, the anima being the woman, and um, and then leading on to this cultivation of a strong spirit. So, of course, traditionally speaking, and this is a very, um, you know, usual classical view, let's say, the woman is the um, emotion, the man is the, the thoughts, as I've talked about, or the, you know, the logic, the philosophical side, all the rest of it. The woman 
is more introverted and the man more extroverted and funnily enough as a biological kind of symbolism of this psychology the man has an extroverted phallus the woman has an introverted vagina so it, it you know that comes into it quite suspiciously in a sense it's almost uh, quite quite ironic that that's the case as well and how much that has to do with you know that biological representation has to do with the 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 psychology or the psychological differences between man and woman it, it, you know obviously we can't really predetermine that massively or anything like that or understand that massively in any uh, big way but even just as a symbolic factor it's quite quite interesting quite funny as well and uh, uh, you know I mean this is getting on to Freudian territory I suppose but the kind of masculine the man always uses the sword the man is always the the hero who goes out with his sword and and uh, to what extent that was a mythological representation of the phallus in a way in terms of not as the phallus in a terms of sexual repressed kind of way but as the phallus is a symbol of power as a phallus of a symbol of um almost um overcoming um and that that is also a representation psychologically of the overcoming of the mother complex in a way the 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 task of the boy to to overcome his mother um go out there partake in certain trials and then of course attain the the gift of the goddess which really is in human terms the gift of the normal woman or the relationship with the normal woman and the coming down from the anima fascination not only the anima fascination of the mother and the, the feminine receptacle fascination of the mother as well um but um also the the anima fascination of his own internal that kind of femininity and the those projections that come with it onto the external woman um and the overcoming of that kind of fantasy uh, element really and uh, and that comes about really as a psychological phenomenon that comes about over many many years of development that's not just a, an overcoming of like like let's say someone killing a dragon like george and the dragon or something. it's not as quick as that or anything like that it's a overcoming of a long time and um and it characterizes itself by many many psychological battles of um you know feeling down and feeling moody and feeling all these kind of things that that the man has to deal with with regard to his unconscious anima his unconscious feminine side um and uh, the, the real the real gift of the anima over the 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 relationship with the of a relational function with this human woman and especially within the confines of a relationship is this kind of thing that i'm speaking about with regards to the the feminine being a receptacle and and that's psychologically true that's not uh, physically true or then although again we have this nice little parallel symbolic may it be or maybe even more than symbolic um of, of the woman having the the introverted vagina which is a receptacle for the phallus you see so we have that pair in there as well which is very interesting but um um and, and it seems the two are linked psychologically and, and and anatomically of course um it's not just a symbolic thing but to see the kind of the, the links the etiology all the rest of it it's far too fine and it's far too you know it would be just superfluous to even bother looking into that really um but nonetheless that's kind of a thing so talking a little bit about the the anima the feminine principle being the soul um being that thing which uh the man projects onto the emotions and the the warming home shall we say this can be seen very very easily in women with regards to when they um when they're around a man that they're attracted to they give him the ability to speak you'll notice that when I, and if you are a woman yourself you'll notice it way more than me or you'll be able to understand it pick it apart way more than me but it seems to me that a woman gives that man time to speak and this is a part of it bleeds into very very slowly the loyalty of the anima that Jung talked about um especially with regards to memory as well and um a woman seems to be able to remember vast amounts of what a man talks to her about and this seems to be in in relation to this this loyalty um and and so when when a, a woman is let's say 
infatuated with a man and they're talking and all the rest of it. A man being the spirit, which is to say that, you know, very kind of assertive, it's kind of classical uh, masculine figure, let's say, just just to put it as that way. I'm not talking about physiologically here or anything like that. I'm talking about psychologically as well. I mean, obviously, anatomically, physically, uh, even physiologically, there is that kind of strength and assertion within the man as well. And that's the sexual dimorphism coming across with regards to a um, an anatomical representation a genetic and anatomical representation of the archetypes, the animus being the representative of this strong figure, physically strong, more muscles, etc. And then the woman being this more shapely, curvy, curvy figure, the anima, the enchantress, the kind of, the, also the reciprocal as well, and, and the kind of the, 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 the feminine kind of a law and that's something that's in common speech as well is feminine a law and there's many many things that in fact it, it greatly excites me whenever i discover them that there is many many colloquial well, colloquialisms you know phrases things like that that we all use all the time that actually express the anima of the animus or any other archetype um uh, just simply within a colloquialism and it's quite interesting when you start to understand them and, and get to know them um, so the man you know t tends to pour himself into a woman and, and generally when a woman's younger um, she especially if she likes him she's going to accept that more and she's going to be molded quite a lot by that spirit of the, of the man and of course this is what Jung talked about as well it bleeds into what Jung talked about as the woman the feminine looking at the man as kind of this godly figure and uh, I've had experiences with that myself as well with looking at men and it's it's not it's different from an idolization of you know mere intellect or anything like that it's not well you idolize someone because they're this great man or whatever intellectually um, in a sense that would be the professor level of the animus a third level of animus development if I'm not mistaken and uh, it would also bleed him, you know, to father ideals and things like that as well. You, and, and then you get on to, as a, another end of that, you get onto the more like complexes and patholo more pathological phenomena, father complexes, this, that, or the other, you know, um, and the negative psychodynamics and stuff. Um, but uh, the way in which a woman sees a man as this godlike figure is that he does things that she thinks that she can't do, but actually she will do in time and she can possess just as much authority and this kind of, let's say, this godliness that she projects onto the man. She projects that and then she withdraws it. And this is why you generally see about a woman of 40, 45, 50, she's not taking anything from, from men anymore in terms of like this projection. She just has her masculinity, you know, I'm talking in a good development, in a strong development, she has her masculinity firmly in her own consciousness to a degree, and and, and she she's able to kind of hold her own, you know, that's why, I met, this is a colloquialism, oh, you know, that, oh, that Vera, she can hold her own, you know, that's the colloquialism about the archetypes, you see, that's one of those things, that, or, or one of these phrases that we use that actually express an archetypal situation, there's hundreds of them, hundreds of them, um, not to mention the ones that are slightly more indirect, like that obviously have an archetypal theme in them, like every cloud has a silver white lining and stuff like that, relating to the wise old man, wise old woman personality type, and uh, uh, that kind of type, archetypal theme. And uh, and of course, when you hear, let's say, your grandparents say that to you, it hits more powerfully because they've got the the anatomical representation of the you know beard or you know wrinkled skin and we associate that as an image with the wise old man so it hits more and you're like boom whereas you know you say that from a, a young person that's really why a lot of people um wouldn't take me you know if i was let's say on a stage somewhere doing um really talking as i am now in in depth about these things they'd be less likely to take me as seriously be like isn't he a bit young to be doing this? You see, and that's an archetypal thing because they're expecting me to be an old man. 
Whereas, let's say when I'm older, and, you know, I've got a few years on my belt, or maybe even grown out a beard because I think, because because obviously I'm wise to this stuff, and I might think, well, maybe if I grow a beard, maybe we'll project the wise old man more on me, and then you know I'll get more of that archetypal experience, and maybe I'll get more of that kind of mana power from the from the collective crowd. You see. Um, that's a very shadowy, that's a bit of my shadow coming out there for you, actually. Um, only mine a little bit, so. Um, but no, yeah, so it's uh, things like that, you see. And and you can, uh, and then, of course, they would be more likely to accept more what I'm saying and really take it on board because they've got that stronger projection onto me or even kind of a bit of a transference in a sense but i mean what really is the distinction between those two there's not much of a distinction considering what i've you know experienced myself and what i've read as well some people some of the Jungians say well really transference projection or transference is a is a type of projection and anelia yafway says that um and, and really, it is, I mean, a transference, we could say, is a stronger form of projection, I'll give you that, but there's not much difference, really, in it. So anyway, the, the, the woman sees this man as this godly, fit, and it's weird, it's a weird feeling. You get this kind of feeling of, he's going to take care of me. That's the feeling that a woman, that, I kid you not, that's the feeling. A young woman who is a little bit uncertain of herself, who is a little bit kind of, you know, uh, maybe she might be a little bit higher in trait neuroticism, that's to say she's a little bit more predisposed to anxiety, all that sort of stuff. You get this feeling that's like a, a warming feeling, but it's also a strength, it's almost like, imagine a man, a strong man, who you adore, who you like, right? grabs your arm or something, and, and uh, but in a really kind of, you know, a uh, direct way, a really thing that, that really shows you that masculine certainty, that masculine certainty, that energy, uh, and he grab you and they, they tell you something, and, and you just look at them and you're like, wow, you know, you just get this archetypal experience. You get this pattern in this, as Michael Conforti would say, this kind of, it, it almost it does bleed into this archetypal pattern in a sense, um, because it is a repetitive thing that, that happens and that is there. Um, whereas a man, and I can tell you this more certainly because I do have, I've had many, many animal projections, it is the most all in trancing experience to have an anima projection, I mean a big one, you, you, you're not, there's no relationship to the, to the individual woman, you know, and this is the, the woman as this kind of enigmatic, elusive, almost voidness in a sense, mysteriousness, all that sort of stuff, and that is directly to, relating to Again, this kind of womb, this kind of this kind of dark home, and when I say dark, I don't mean in a negative sense. I mean dark as in this kind of mysterious, un un uncategorizable home of the feminine, and and the man projects this kind of maternal warming home onto that woman, and it's course it seems to be you know, the archetypal experience seems to be on a very very gradiented level, and it can go right, it goes right back to the, the, um, the, you know, anatomy and the physiology of the fact that there's a womb there as well. And, um, of course, there's these projections that we have um, in all other varieties as well, um, you know, into space and things like that. And I've talked about this before with, like, the voidness of space and then the conquering of space by the, by the rockets and things. And you see the, the anima, animus play there you see we want to go out into the voidness of space to see what we can find and you see that's always an, an anima thing because what when a man projects his anima onto a woman he wants to try and find something in her he wants to try and find some sort of experience but he never fully can he can never grasp what what this anima what his own anima projected onto that woman is he's, he's really like that's exactly the same with this space race and this wanting to get to other um, places in the universe we're projecting out the anima, that mysteriousness, the, the, the emotional investment of the idea into space 
with all the mysteriousness of it. And then the, the phallic symbol of the rocket going up into space, pushing into the womb in a sense as well. You see, there's all these sorts of projections on various different levels and various different ways. Um, and it's not it's not just sexual. I mean, I've, I've coloured it in a sexual manner. It's not sexual, actually. It's, it's more just the anima, animus interplay. Um, um, you can see it as sexual, of course, but it's not. There's there's many other ways in which you're experiencing that archetypal reality, of, you know, even in that domain. So when the man projects this, he's experiencing, and and it it's almost it's not individual. It's trans individual. It's beyond the individual, and he, he's just infatuated with this woman. You can't, and it's like Jung says. Oh, he comes to me and he says, "Doctor, doctor, I, 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 I want to get rid of this. I have to get rid of this woman, uh, but, but I just can't do it. I can't get rid of this woman." And it's exactly like that. No simpler way of putting it. It's, uh, <laughs> you, you cannot get rid of that woman because a part of your psychology, your internal psychology, is projected so strongly onto that object, the Maya illusion of the object that I've talked about before. That um, that you can't do it. That that you know you you have to have that object. You have to attain that object, and that relates to the sexuality and the the sensuality of a young man, uh, which is at first wholly dependent on the object, the external object of a woman, and wanting to to possess the woman and the the the, the sexual desires that come with that and the the. Um, uh, kind of the, the want to make union with that woman sexually of course but also in a in a deeper psychological sense of course because there's there's the animal in the unconscious and the the man longs for that psychologically as much as of course that physiological um uh, orgasm as well or the the repetition of that over time of course and um so the man it's very very it's like you see, you see this a lot. When I, I, I do get quite a lot of, um, I, I get a little bit of what do you call it? I don't know, excitement or humour in a sense from watching young men, especially when the, you know, mid-teens, later teens, let's say, running round after these women, and they're totally. I mean, I've done it before. You know, we've all done it. It's all, you know, an experience. It's an archetypal experience that people go with. But, you get fascinated by this woman and, and there is this will and idea now of course this isn't a very nice way to put it but and it's very 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 classical way of putting it but the animal and animus also in the animal kingdom are predator prey you know the animus being predator anima being prey and uh, of course we have so all sorts of different anatomical representations of that for example like the predators with the eyes at the front and the prey with the eyes at the sides and all that sort of stuff but that is an animal animus interplay as well even cross species um like you know a lion wants the gazelles or whatever it is they eat and uh, the gazelles are the anima and the lions are the more animus you know in, in terms of that species dynamic and it, and it is true to an extent, although it's not very, as I say, it's not the best way to conceptualise it in terms of a, a, a nice way of conceptualising it. But it is true, like, the, the man is the predator who goes out and gets the, the woman, you know, in a sense. And that's, as I say, that's echoed in the species dynamics of, of um, uh, in another way, in a different way, uh, is the predator prey there and there. So it's not exactly right because it isn't a predator prey relationship because of course the man uh, doesn't actually want to kill the woman or anything or well he wouldn't have the object there um, and of course that's the way in which evolution uh, in an evolutionary perspective the, the man um, the, the, the kind of uh, interspecies relation in terms of the, the uh, sex relation between man and woman as as kind of has to be um, harmless and the harmful element of masculinity or the harmful ele element of femininity has to be projected out onto the environment so that then, you know, I mean, you could say primitively onto uh, different threats in the environment, for example, animals and stuff like that. And uh, that means that then in the confines of that particular family, the harmful element of the masculine, harmful element of the feminine 
projected outward as a protect as a protection mechanism for let's say if they had a newborn or whatever and and then that that psychological mechanism the harmful dominant element of the masculine the kill almost the in in primitive uh, terms the the killing element of the masculine the the instinct to kill as well that comes into it back then nowadays obviously the instinct to kill is kind of in a part repressed in a part lying dormant um but collectively we kind of uh we feel fulfilled uh, in our own herd instincts to kill in a sense uh, or individual instincts to kill by the projection psychological projection onto mass murders and onto murderers who then fulfill that within the confines of a psychological projection so then everyone doesn't have to go out there murdering and all the rest of it but nonetheless that's why murderers have to exist because if they didn't we'd be completely repressed of the, of the instinct to kill and then we're fucked as a society we're just like you know people would just blow up would just be like a kettle as of, of this is the analogy i've used before like a kettle but imagine there's like it's completely sealed in and the steam just bubbles up and bubbles up and then suddenly it just like goes over or whatever it's like a pan maybe a pan's a better analogy where it just bubbles over because you put the lid right down over it turn the heat up um uh, but yeah, what they would do is those harmful aspects of masculinity or femininity, especially the possessive aspects of the feminine, as well as the dominant aspects of the masculine, projected out onto these animals and the environment, so to project, protect the child, and then carries on, carries on, carries on, etc. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the you know the interplay of animal and animus and all the rest of it, and um, it, it is very very interesting to see. And I mean, you only need to look, start to look at your personal relationships, and you start to see this reciprocal side of the, the feminine, or this this kind of uh, different side of the masculine as well. Uh, you start to see where the animus, the negative side of the animus in the unconscious of a woman might get the woman from time to time, uh, where the unconscious anima gets the man, as I mentioned, in moods and all these kind of different things. Uh, many, many different ways it gets the, 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 the man. It's incredible, the variety. It's, it's like a spectrum of all different sorts of things. Um, and, and the way in which a man doesn't accept his sentimentality or doesn't accept his... Um, maybe a little bit uh, more easily accepts his sensuality in the sen as in the feminine sense of sensuality, not the masculine sense of sensuality, because, well, what really is the masculine sense of sensuality? Um, uh, but maybe a little bit more of that in terms of more easily accepts that, but uh, certainly that sentimentality, that, that being able to be... Um, Jung put it in a good way. Jung said that, um, you know, why should we approach a woman in a terrible manner? You know, let's say as a man, let's say let's say you're a particularly masculine man. I'm not a particularly masculine man, so I don't feel this as much as other people. But, um, you know, let's say you are a particularly masculine man, then, of course, uh, uh, this speaks to those people, I suppose, more. But why approach a woman as, let's say, that very masculine force and all the rest of it and dominant and all the rest of it? why not approach a woman in a holistic way that allows for the development of, of anything in that situation psychologically to arise and, and, and for her to feel the, the worth and the value um, from her own animus as projected onto that man who is actually being a, a very positive vessel for the creativity of her own animus. If you have a man who's constantly closing down a woman her animus is liable to get a little bit negative because, of course, she's projecting onto this man and he's being very, very negative. Whereas if you get a man who has that very positive animus and actually encourages that within the woman internally, then she's liable to get more creative and, and, and become more of a uh, holistic person herself. And, 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 and that is com that comes through this kind of projection and then withdrawal of it over a long time within the confines of that particular relate you know the relationship that relational function as well um and uh, so so that puts it in quite a good way in terms of um uh actually kind of like a man what Jung te said there as a man kind of having that difference and having that um 
that ability to to access his feminine side and be holistic and and not be one way or not be another you know a very Jungian idea not to be one-sided I'm just gonna turn that up a bit actually because it's a bit funny anyway we'll see how it goes um so yeah that's quite an interesting way and uh it, it's it's very interesting to see these dynamics as well but I want to now we've like really laid a lot of groundwork for these things and particularly I mean I've not really discussed too much of the philosophical side of the masculine or or anything like that specifically. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, just to reiterate, as I mentioned in the other part, um, the, the kind of these things are not just black or white or anything. There can be many women who are very philosophical and all the rest of it, more philosophical than some men, or more uh, logical and thinking than some men. There can be some men who can be way more emotional um, than than some women, so it, it it and there's loads as I've said loads of different spectrums of this. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't really think I need to touch upon too much more with regards to like that philosophical element of um, of the masculine and and how that comes about, like within society, in the collective rules that we have, in the kind of. Um, uh, laws of the land in all these kind of things and that generating an, an animus rule essentially um which then let's say if you've got someone who's quite neurotic or, or got quite a lot of complexes and um it does have strong issues with authority then you start to get a very very strong or you can start to get very very strong animus projections into the rules of authority itself and that closes down the person now if you have a woman like that um, it, it's liable to kind of make her feel very uh, closed off, not not at all happy. Um, if, let's say, um, a woman even projects onto a man, let's say she has some sort of animus issues herself, or some sort of issues that have caused her to have issues with authority in general, but if she then projects onto this man that severely, and he doesn't do things that, or he creates rules in a sense, or he says things by the the word, the logos, basically, the, the that spiritual world word, let's say. If he says certain things um, to that woman, then and and she doesn't particularly like those things or has a different view, then her animus and um, that's strongly projected onto that man is gonna close her down like hell, and she's gonna feel like really down, really almost depressed um, and feel uh, as if she's not got a voice. I think the, the most prominent thing there is that she feels as if she's not got a voice. And and, and this is where I, I say about this positive animus, about being this positive animus for a woman to be able to give her a voice, to be able to allow her to to... Uh, to not feel closed down because there is those projections there. In a normal development, it's not so bad. In a in an abnormal de in an abnormal development, let's say, it is a little bit bad, or it can be quite bad. Um, and then your interpersonal relationships are coloured. Let's say you're not conscious of your complexes. Your interpersonal relationships are coloured by aggression, anger, projection, shadow projection, all these sorts of things, um, feeling as if you're not heard, then kind of feeling um, inferior and feeling kind of sad or um, feeling guilty for what you've said, you know, in your kind of out complex, you know, your outburst formulated form complexes that you've got, all that sort of stuff, and it's never, never a good thing. Um, but yeah, so I think what we'll do is round off the video with me talking a little bit about this spirit and the cultivation of a strong spirit. And I mean, this might take me another 15 minutes or so to, to start to understand. So this this idea of the strong spirit, you know, as I've talked about at the start of this video, I never really, never really got on board with first off. And then I slowly started to get on board with this idea that yes, the spirit does exist. Yes, the, the soul does exist in... Um, you know, you're predefined, as I've talked about before, and this is a good way of conceiving of the soul. 
your predefined neurological structure based on your genetics, based on your genome from, obviously that's, well, of course, what you got from your parents and, and therefore it's going to be similar to what you got from your parents or similar to your parents' dynamics. And the, the kind of um, compulsion, uh, the object compulsion in the world uh, of the investment, the emotional investment of the idea into something that, that fits your neurological structure bang on. And that's your soul. Your soul is the thing that that unifies the internal genetic structure with the outer object and the correct outer object. And that is your soul. And what is your soul? Well, you have to find that yourself. You know, for me, it it, it wasn't a problem to find it. I've always known what it is. I just never t- termed it my soul. Um, and I would say my soul, or, or, or what we would say in, in a Jungian sense, my personal myth, um, is eccentricity. And that's strongly related, of course, to the archetypal experience of the trickster. Um, um, and all these different things like uh, creativity and stuff like that. And you, you, as I've talked about, you see this in characters in, in literature like the Mad Hatter, Willy Wonka, those types, Mary Poppins, those types of, of people. And you see this out in the world, as I've mentioned before as well, like Jim Carrey, Jack Black, Robin Williams, people along those sorts of lines. Um, Lady Gaga to an extent, um, although I do think she's got different aspects to us. Well, I mean, everyone has different aspects to them anyway, but certainly I think Lady Gaga has uh, some more prominent different aspects than let's say we're talking about someone like... um, uh, Robin Williams or Jim Carrey or something who, are, who really are kind of that eccentricity and so that's your soul and, and, and that can differentiate itself that eccentricity and creativity can bleed into multiple fields so you could say well a part of your soul encapsulates art or a part of your soul encapsulates comedy or this or that and, and that's the kind of expression of your soul in various different manners of which best fit your genetic neurological structure in the way your brain works some people's souls are science some people's souls are like it and things like that because the the emotional investment of the the, the idea um that it aligns with that the, just the way their brain works the way their genetics have been made up just happens to absolutely adore and love IT and they can just do it all the time they never have to stop and that's the soul because it's not uh, you see that isn't a job that's a vocation they're not doing a job they never never worked a day in their life they're doing a vocation and the vocation is the soul that's the soul it's not it's not anything other than that the, the vocation is the soul and um so that's very very interesting um, now, the cultivation of spirit, which is talked about in The Secret of Golden Flower, the, uh, secret relig- uh, the religion of the secret elixir of life, or whatever it's called, in the 6th century or 8th century, um, uh, with, you know, as a subset of Taoism, which is the, the alchemical tradition within Taoism, um, of course, it's differentiated, uh, you know, alchem- alchemy is differentiated all over different parts of the world, um, but in in China, it's you know centered around mainly this this kind of secret flower, golden flower, um, and that's a form of the Lapis Philosophorum, uh, you know, of a, the attainment of the quintessence and things like that. Um, I think you can also call it the Agua Permanence, or however you say it in Latin, um, and uh, and and so it's said, it's highlighted in that text, in the commentary on that text by C. G. Jung and, and Richard Wilhelm. Um, about how you cultivate the spirit. Now, I'm going to put that into very um, brief terms, and I'm going to put it into more psychological terms, and I'm not going to put it into uh, too much mystical terms. I said maybe at the start that I would, uh, or I would talk about it maybe a little bit like that, but in fact, it's easier just to say one, a few little things about the cultivation of the spirit. Um, because it's not all that difficult. So first off, we've talked about what the spirit is, or partially what the spirit is, but let's just define it very, very easily. So the spirit, in uh, you know, as Christianity would say it, or um, the will, or anything like that, we just call it, we're just going to say that the spirit 
is the will, the innate will that you possess. I possess a will right now and I am directing my will in my words towards you, I'm thrusting it. And, and I'm constantly in a union of anima and animus when I'm, ta when I'm pr producing words here because the words are the thoughts and the thoughts of the anima and the, uh, the will that I'm producing, you know, I'm producing those thoughts through a will, that's the animus, that's a logos, that's the, um, the, the, the rule, the spiritual rule, that's the animus rule. Um, and when you've got a, a pathological condition in someone uh, and they have a strong projection onto someone else, like I've talked about, then let's say I say I create a rule for that person because it, they're projecting their animus massively onto me, then suddenly I possess the logos, the meaning, the, um, the, the kind of um, spiritual height of saying that that is the way it's going to be. And so then they take that as, as a gospel, as a rule, like Moses coming down with the stone tablets and drawing on the Mos and everyone must take them as gospel. And it's an animus figure coming down because it's Moses and he's got his beard or whatever it is. And, uh, and so it's very much that projection and that's, that's that. Um, so that's the will. And of course, the will and the idea are playing all the time. You know, it's like I've, even if I'm unconscious, as I mentioned before, I'm waving this hand about. I can't do that without having the, whether it be conscious or unconscious, by having, before having the idea of it, I have to have the idea of it, but I have to also have a will. So I have will and idea to form the actual physical action in the world, to form the world. And that is, um, what Jung referred to the animus bringing forth something that he called the, the sperm, spermatic world or, or whatever it was. Now, what he means by that is the, obviously the sperm in terms of the sperm creates the, the child, the physical child, and, and that's the physical world as well. It's not only, you know, in that sense, but it's the, the creation of the physical world um, through that will as well. So it's a, it's a, closing down of the multiplicity of ideas in your mind and, and focusing the will on one idea and then the creation of it. And that and the will and the idea can only become manifest through the body. And there you get the, as I've talked about previously in this video, the you know soul, spirit, body. And that's how the, un the entire universe is, is that. Because you cannot have manifest the anima, the animus or the yin and the yang or the, the idea and the will without the, the the vessel of the soma, and uh, and that could be thought of in alchemical terms as well, with with the body being being the vessel. It really, you know, from a psychological perspective in alchemy, the ego is the vessel. But you could say that the body as a whole and the body is tied with the ego is is the vessel in some sense, and and that is actually true because. The, the main way in which you cultivate a strong spirit is by overcoming your fears. And then you get over the anima, you see. Uh, and, and in that sense, your body, your physiology, starts to become more... Jordan Peterson's talked about it. It's bec it becomes harmonised. Your psychology and your, your body becomes harmonised. And uh, he's right in that. And this is where you start to get the feelings of lightness and the mystical experiences, the peak experiences, as the humanists call them. And... Um, and this is basically, um, as you overcome more and more fears, um, psychobiologically, you've got less complexes. And you've got complexes all up, up here uh, around your mother, around your father, around this, around that. You've had bad experiences when you're young. And then you get fear responses. You know, the amygdala fires, limbic system fires. You have all these kind of um, uh, hormones rushing around your body, cortisol and all that sort of stuff. Because you've got unresolved com conflicts in your psychology which are nested physically in the brain, in the hippocampus, in memories and things like all, all the rest of it. And so um, whenever you see someone and you're in an unfavorable con uh, situation or you don't want to do something, let's say you don't want to go to the dentist or something like that, you don't want to go to um, the doctors or you don't want to go here or you don't want to go to a roller coaster ride or anything like that, um, then what happens is... Um, if you're faced with that prospect and you, you know you might have some sort of generalized anxiety beforehand which is the projection out onto the future of what it might be and what it might be like and all that and that's from your past of course but also when you get there you might have panic disorder or you might have something like that and then you'll get an anxiety attack and that's the psychobiological nature of the complex because of your past exp negative past experiences in childhood making a physiological reaction more cortisol more stress reinforces itself positive well 
I don't know whether it would reinforce it negatively or positively, and I don't know which way around that would be, but it reinforces itself anyway. And then um, it just, you know, you get, you can actually go down a, a negative feedback loop or negative spiral downward so that then you never do anything and you just stay at home and you do all that and all the rest of it. And um, then that means, of course, that you're under the, the fetters of the animal as it's talked about in The Secret of the Golden Flower, which means to say that you, um, your animus has been closed down by uh, the anima, the idea as emotionally charged and invested into the uh, different anxiety-ridden things that, that you've got to do or that you should do. Um, and that means that that has negative effects on the body because of the, produ the higher production of cortisol and therefore you're more predisposed to illness as, as a long-term you know, uh, long phenomena uh, if this keeps on going, you know, and you're more predisposed much longer term to other ailments as well and um so so therefore that's the um that would be the negative manifestation of it whereas if you use your animus to overcome the fears you go out there and say i'm going to go to the dentist and you go to the dentist and then your bloody anxiety all the rest of it and all that sort of stuff but then you come back and then you do it again and you do it again and this is just exposure therapy basically now just modern exposure therapy you could even use it in something called implosion therapy which is uh, where you just do something like to the full extent straight away you know good examples of that are like let's say you're, you're scared of snakes you go to the zoo and you literally just go in and you hold about six snakes uh, one after the other and that would be implosion therapy but the literature as i've looked upon it uh, when doing aspects of clinical psychology this time around it seems to be that um if you just slowly do exposure therapy then it's better, although implosion therapy can sometimes work. Uh, I've had instances where I've done implosion therapy myself, uh, you know, on myself to get over complexes, and it does work to a degree, but you have to be in the mindset, you have to be in that mode of being, and you have to have, I would say you have to have cultivated a little bit of spirit firsthand as well, uh, before you can start to really get into that, otherwise the animal just closes you down, you see, and you just want to go away, you're just like, no, no, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, and, then, boom. and that's the animal, that's the, the severe emotional investment of the idea into the thing that you've got to do, but so you do this repetitively, uh, and then what happens is, slowly that thing of doing it more and more and more um, becomes less emotionally charged. That That is to say that your exposure to it has reduced the complex in the unconscious. And you can actually feel this. I've felt this with many, many complexes I've got rid of. I, I've always said it. I've been a poster boy for Freud and Jung's complexes. I had every complex in the book. You name it, I've I, you know, I've had it, bloody everything, uh, even um, Adler's, com you know, superiority, and fit, or I've had it all, so, you know, and I've always pri prided, prided myself, been proud of myself, I don't even know, I've always prided myself, we're going to use prided, I've always prided myself on the fact that I've experienced it subjectively, and I've got a bit of objective knowledge, so it means that I can, um, actually help other people overcome this this in the future and, and you know get people out of it because i know the full story i know the objective side to us to some degree to a lesser funnily enough to a lesser degree than, than i know the subjective but nonetheless i've got both so i can see so you can actually feel that then over time what happens is that complex just reduces all, almost to nothing in fact sometimes to nothing quite a lot of the time to nothing actually and then the physiological effects uh, over time wear off then what happens is, let's say you've got severe panic disorder, right at the start of this, before you've even attempted any of your fears or stepped up in any sort of way, you just have panic attacks all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, for whatever. Then um, once you overcome these fears a bit, they reduce a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, and then reduce more and more and more until you get to the stage that you've overcome enough complexes that the psyche can autonomously balance itself a bit better and then it doesn't give the signals to the body the brain doesn't give the hormonal signals to the body to produce that adrenaline and to go into that panic attack mode uh, and then you don't get panic attacks but you'll still have some level of anxiety especially if you've had generalized anxiety comorbid with panic disorder for example that's just a good example because sometimes those can be comorbid a lot of anxiety disorders can be comorbid with one another and stuff and even depression can be comorbid with something like for example generalized anxiety disorder but we'll keep it simple and we'll just say these two then what happens is 
you need, this is the moment when you stop having your panic attacks and you start you know you're getting out there and you've overcome a good few complexes this is a moment where you have to ramp it up and this is the real generation of the spirit in a Jungian sense uh, by a more macro generation of the spirit which is overcoming the fears that normal people have so we, you know a lot of normal people who aren't into psychology or anything have a lot of fears roller coasters snakes spiders uh uh, doctors, you, you you name it, you know, I mean, doctors is a little bit one where there's more of a strong complex around it, uh, some animal fears can be more, slightly more like biologically based in a sense, um, uh, and like, um, you know, roller coasters is, is kind of more innate because of like the fear of falling and all the rest of it, so there's a kind of a more biological genetic component in that, so there's, uh, you know, you can allow that fear, it's not necessarily something that you need to overcome, you need to overcome, because there'll always be a small level of, of fear there that is primal, that is within you, um, so that's not too bad, but imagine you've got those fears, then what you can do to cultivate this, this animus, this strong spirit, to override the negativity of the anima, and to get more um, kind of um, external uh, integration, integration with the the, the uh, external world, so that then you have far fewer fears, is you overcome all those things that you don't want to do, so um, for me, like scary movies, stuff like that, that's not, that. obviously that's not an inherent thing, that's a socialised thing, so that's something for me to, uh, that's why I'm watching Walking Dead at the minute, um, and things like that, you have to cultivate this spirit and get over these things, and um, uh, and and then what happens? I mean, I, I don't have personal experience of this, but I do have some personal experience of this because I'm working my way towards it. Is you uh, your physiology harmonizes so much because you've got no co like well, no, you're not you've not got no complexes because we always have some complexes, but you have so few complexes in the unconscious that basically uh, your organ. I mean, I've had personal experience with this. Uh, to a good degree, actually, so I tell a word of a lie that I've not, but your organs feel so light, it's incredible, I've, I've felt this numerous times, but when you get to a really strong point, like, you hardly have any fears left, like, there's only the, the primal fears that you've got left that are, that are innate and genetic, fear of falling, fear of loud noises, things like that, that, you know, can be accepted with sympathy within you as a, as a natural fear, when you got rid of all these things, because your outer adaption, your adaption to the external world is so great that, you know, you're, you're this, you're this, as Nietzsche would put it, almost, you know, you're almost a bridge to a, to an overman, um, then, of course, your physiology harmonizes and you don't, you, you don't have anxiety, you see, and that, in a way, is the road, uh, to becoming an alpha personality as well, you know, we speak of alpha male, alpha female, these are the people who have done that, not only have they done that, but they've also cemented themselves within their work, so they, they have a lot of what we term now, in trait psychology, something called grit, which is actually a really good word for it, now grit, uh, I think it's Angela Duckworth who created that, that concept, it is basically just another word for the Jungian spirit, it's no different, but let's just take grit, call it that, um, uh, they have a lot of grit, so that means that not only do they have a lot of spirit in overcoming their fears, but they've also had a lot of spirit with regards to getting up early, doing the work that they need to do, doing the vocational work that they need to do, so they've got that very, very strong soul, passionate investment into what they do, so they're aligned with their soul, both on a, on a career basis and on an overcoming fears basis, um, that then allows them harmon harmony physiologically and psychologically, and allows them to move through life most effectively, and uh, they also can get closer to a real full expression of individuation when they become maybe in the 40s or 50s, um, I always think for, for myself, I've, I've always kind of thought 50s is probably going to be about right, and I wouldn't want it any sooner than that, I, you know, uh, I, uh, I'd rather do the work, you know, and get there and really cement, you know, that individuation, and it'd be a, a nice thing to, to, to then relax into, shall we say, as the years go on. Now, the less you adapt, the less you adapt to your outer surroundings, to the outer environment, the more um, the dreams are going to try and push you to that, but the more you ignore your dreams, the more then um, you, you're just going back into that kind of realm of, of, of um, normality in which, I say normality in a specific way, in the sense of um, not 
not actually doing your duty to um, life. And I'll say life, I won't, I won't say God or I won't say the universe, although we could use those words, but doing your duty to life. Imagine life has given you this body and given you a potential for expression with regards to your career and your, 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 the way in which you are, the person you are, and, um, and, and how great that can be, essentially, as its, as its best expression. And I'm not talking about in some Nietzschean, power-driven way because that's quite shadowy. I'm talking about the best expression of you as a holistic being, as someone who can be kind to others, sim- have sympathy, be, be this beacon of society that is, that is, yes, maybe a bit shadowy, and that's clearly very strong as a personality, very sort of almost, you would term it this alpha personality. But you see, obviously, an al- no alpha personality um, has too much superiority within them because if you have con- very very strong overabundance of conscious superiority that's not an alpha male or that's not an alpha female um, that's just someone who might likely um, be compensate overcompensating wanting to, to feel like that wanting to be like that because actually inside themselves they've got some inferiorities true alpha personality would just be as they are whether that be quite feminine or whether that be quite um you know not necessarily a dominant person per se but nonetheless can be dominant when they need to be and will be um but they will be so in the confines of their individuality not not by some stereotypical masculinity or femininity but in the confines of their own being in their own individuality and they will assert that as they see fit in the right way and through the wholeness of their individuality. And so that's why we have to think. Um, uh, also, you know, we, we, there's many, many traps you can get, you can fall into, you see, like this kind of over-dependence on the shadow, over-dependence on the power drive, like Nietzsche fell into himself, where uh, he idolised Zarathustra, he idolised this kind of power element, the power instinct, the dominance instinct, that sort of stuff. Uh, and that's a pitfall on the way to individuation, and, and it's sometimes it's quite a hard pitfall to to recover from or to to um, not fall down because because it, the shadow possesses you and it possesses you without your your being conscious sometimes, and so that means that you can't fully align to your holistic reality. And what your holistic reality means is to incorporate the shadow as a part of your personality, not as the full personality, as a part of your personality. So that then it allows you to gain resources uh, in, the, in the world and allows you to interact with the world on the terms that you um, need, you know, need to interact with. And that's the, that's the, pers- the kind of the integrated, not the personal shadow, because the personal shadow would, would therefore be in the unconscious, but the integrated personal shadow into your consciousness of, you know, these kind of little things of assertion, of... Um, maybe even a little bit manipulation at times you know but the difference between uh, kind of unintegrated shadow let's say of manipulation or an integrated shadow of manipulation is that the the self or even like the ego's relationship to the self via the ego self axis that it doesn't get overcome or 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 kind of infected by the shadow it it uses the shadow if it's going to use manipulation, if the ego is going to use manipulation, if it's integrated with that shadow, it's going to use it in an effective way that, um, well, it's going to use it in a couple of ways. It's either going to use it in a positive way that's effective and that actually overall helps the situation because there are situations where something like manipulation can be a positive aid to a situation within a family or within uh, relationships outside the family or within uh, career or whatever it may be. Um, Or it's going to use it in a negative way, but it's going to be fine with it. It's not going to have any guilt or or much guilt at all, really, with it. And that process of getting over the guilt of the shadow in its form of manipulation or something like that is a very slow process and it can take quite a while. And if you've got psychopathological phenomena or whatever if you've got things within you like that um complexes and stu- such then you're going to feel a lot of guilt but then as the complexes wear away and you 
come to terms with your shadow more and more, you're not going to feel as, as guilty. Um, and, and that's going to place itself within you in its correct place. And you're going to be able to, to formulate that in a, in a sort of masculine certainty. And I say that whether you're a woman or a man, just in a certainty um, of expression of that manipulation. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it will just be there as an integrated part of your personality. Um, and you can even be, and Alan Watts has talked about this actually before, but you can even be, say, in honesty, and this is a good good way of, of integrating as well, in a sense, but it's only a part of the shadow integration honesty. But you, because there's many, many different levels to it and different stages, and, and I'm on different stages as well at the moment. I'm not fully integrated or anything, so, um, you know, I can only talk about what I know, but... Honesty is a good way because you say, well, you, I mean, I always say to people these days, or, you know, and, and it, maybe I got a little bit of this unconsciously from, from Alan Watts, but I mean, a lot of people, my flatmates include, they'll be the first people to tell you I'm a bastard. I'm an absolute bastard. Um, I, and I'm a lovely person as well, but I'm a bastard, you know, so there's those two dichotomies. And um, I love the fact I'm a bastard. I think, it, you know, when I first found Bads, Bads Robinson, and, and that kind of characterization of my personal shadow, I was kind of, I didn't really like him that much, and I wasn't very integrated with him, uh, or I wasn't even integrated with other aspects of my shadow that I've now found, And but now I'm more integrated with them, and, and I like those sides of myself as much as I like the good sides, I like the, the negative sides, the bad sides, and or the, or the bad sides, you see, and... Um, uh, but nonetheless, you know, I may say to people, oh, well, I'm a bastard and I act like a bastard, but um, I try to balance that with sympathy and the lighter parts of my own, and emotionality because, as I've talked about before, I'm very much a feeling type. Um, Jesus, no, no better place to, to understand that than when I was about 13 to 15 or so and... I would be infatuated by girls or I'd be listening to music on a Friday night and going into some sort of uh, uh, beautiful states of musical fusion and stuff that, that were incredibly emotional, incredibly powerful, incredibly feeling. So um, so because of that, naturally, my more holistic side or, or my more kind of, let's say, the lighter side, the lighter side of my ego uh, and, and my personality is sympathetic, caring um wanting people to be okay missing people um being emotional about people being empathetic about people um uh wanting to have fun and and a sense of childlike fun as well that that ties in with that the the child trickster child hyphen trickster archetype kind of bleeding in together uh, that kind of combination and so those things come in um but yeah, nonetheless, the, the shadow can be present. But that's what you have to do anyway, as I was talking about before, to cultivate this spirit. And and the shadow work comes into this quite massively, actually. And, and touching upon that, maybe a touch more would be good. Because um, you have to become the things that you don't think you are. And that's normally, for a normal person, it's normally bad things. It's normally negative things. Yes, Marie-Louise von Franz. Yes, other people. Uh, James uh, Hall, for example, Jungian analyst. Who, uh, I think he died a few years ago now. I think it was like 2013 or something. I don't know. Not, a very, not an incredibly well-known Jungian analyst anyway. But nonetheless, he's done some books and stuff. But he's also said that it's an alter ego and it's not just the bad things. Of course, the shadow isn't just the bad things. As I've talked about, and I will always reiterate that, the shadow is not the bad things. It's the things that you are unconscious of that you don't accept in your personality as currently. Uh, which can be any, any different thing. It doesn't have to be negative. But normally, for the normal person, a lot of it is ne negative. And... Uh, so the shadow work of accepting inside yourself the fact that you're a bit tight, the fact that you're um, easily, you, you've got a lot of jealousy over people, you're easily jealous about things, the fact that you're uh, manipulating, you know, for me personally, my shadow um, characterizes itself in two ways. Really, it's assertion and manipulation. I would even say aggression and manipulation. Maybe aggression's 
a touch far. Maybe in some circumstances a bit more aggression, but more so in most circumstances it's it's assertion. Um, and then in other circumstances it's manipulation. For example, uh, I had a contract for this. We're in a, a flat here for university, and we had a contract that came through for next year. And uh, it said on the bottom of the contract, if you want to pay X um, X rent, which was a better deal on the rent, you have to leave over summer. Well, that's not how I had thought of it last year and thought of what, what we had got last year. So, of course, I was quite annoyed with this and I, I spoke to the girls about it. And I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down. I'm not having this. And uh, funnily enough, I actually I was wearing... Uh, my black t-shirt and my black leather jacket. Now if I wasn't wearing that on that particular occasion, I would go to my wardrobe, I'd get my black black t-shirt, my black leather jacket, and I'd do my hair up and I'd go in. Because you see, that's my manipulation. I will, uh, and I'm, I'm comfortable with doing that. Because I want those people at that place to project onto me the sense of a, a rebel, the sense of someone to fear. Someone who's, you know, means business. And, and leather jacket and the black t-shirt and the black you know black trousers like we've got now that does it that will do that um and so you know i, I was wearing them anyway so i wasn't going to change or anything and i thought well this is good that i'm wearing these because that'll get me so anyway so then i go down and uh, i wasn't happy with the fact that you know i'd been told one way one year and then um, you know they said, oh yeah, you can stay over summer next year for fifty percent rent, or you can say stay, stay this summer for fifty percent rent. I thought, oh that's brilliant, that's great, all the rest of it. Um, and this year it wasn't to be the case; couldn't do that. Um, so I went down and I said, look, I'm not happy with this. I'm, and, and you know, I, I wasn't necessarily incredibly shadowy, you know, not like this. <laughs> but I was just, you know, certain. I'm not happy with this. I think we need to have a chat about this. I think we need to sort these things out. And I managed to get some things negotiated. And I managed to get the 50% over summer. And I managed to get the fact that we can stay here. And that is the perfect representation, the experiential representation of the outer adaption, of, of the inner integration that can then form the outer adaption between the, the relation between a few people with regards to your shadow coming through and actually gaining your resources. That's where it lies. That's where the shadow comes into its element. That's what you should do. That's masculinity right there. That's your that's your your strong spirit in terms of a bit of the shadow side of the spirit, but nonetheless it's that. Um, now to now to take that and to place that into your entire life and to be that way in your entire life, no, don't do not do it. What? Why are you doing that? That's not right. That's not, and I've made the folly of doing that for a long time, like different, but you have to do these follies to get used to it and to integrate. You do, I will say this, I will say it again because I just said it, you have to be a bastard. You have to integrate all those things that are crap inside your shadow into your consciousness then you get some level of integration, then you can pull back, then you can be your whole personality that's kinder and this and that and the other at different times, and then you have the, the conscious ability to actually use your shadow instead of it using you. And this is why Jung talked about the shadow as the apprentice piece. It's not something um, that uh, is, let's say, quite as, as challenging or as dynamic, uh, and I say that in a very, very holistic way, dynamic and very, very strong way, as the anima. The anima uh, uh, of a contrasexual component, let's say, within us, is um, is very, very tricky, much more complex than the shadow in, in, experience, in, in experience. When you see it in experience in various different ways, much more complex. And it always, it can get you over time, mine does as well. Uh, even just in the subtlest little words, in the subtlest little little things, just it gets you. So, um, uh, but the shadows, I mean, the shadow is not easy. Please do not ma let me make you think that. It's not easy. It is hard. It's very hard. And uh, I think that it won't be for a good number of years yet until I've got real integration. 
because I can say things to anyone now. I can say practically anything I'm thinking or saying to a lot of people. Uh, but nonetheless, sometimes the anima closes me down. Sometimes it kind of, mm, maybe not, maybe this, maybe not. You know, there's all this kind of like um, animal uncertainty within the realm of thought about these things. But, but the way of accepting that is accepting, as I've talked about in another video, accepting in a manner of Wu Wei. Um, the flowing or, or act, kind of action non action, which uh, ties to we were very greatly, of of allowing those thoughts come up and go down, come up, go down, and and specifically pushing out via the will. It just went off there for a second, but pushing out via the will, um, the particular thought that comes out at the, the exact moment uh, within that environment. It's very, very, very hard to explain, actually, because I'm still experiencing it myself. Uh, but you can, actually get, uh, you can actually get very, very deep levels of understanding Wu Wei um, by uh, this action, non-action, in the realm of thought and, and, and allowing these things to come up. And allowing things to come up, uh, feelings and thoughts, in relation to the experience that you're having. And in relation to the, emo the emotions that are being generated within you from that experience and uh, accepting those as they stand. And that is a way of actually, and that's why Jung said it was the, the door to opening up the key on the way. Um, that is why, that is how um, you can actually overcome the anima to a very, very strong degree as well through that in by accepting all of the things that come up inside of you as a function of of the totality of human experience as causally interrelated and interconnected um, and coming through you and expressing uh, coming, you know, these things, thoughts, ideas, emotions, even language coming through you, not as something that you wholly dictate, but as something that the entire causal, like sort of micro-causal environment uh, formulates within you and the macro-causal environment has formulated within you as well, uh, if we're talking on a wider viewpoint. So, um, yeah, so that is the real cultivation of the spirit and that is the real kind of being able to become um, uh, uh, much more connected with your spirit and actually harmonise your physiology. And that is also how what the, the ancients called this prolonging life. Um, now, prolonging life uh, with this technique, can you do it? The jury's out on that one, I would say. Um because I think a lot of it has, comes down to gen genetics, um, you know, obviously as a, a more person who's interested in Jung, obviously I would say, oh yes, a lot of it comes down to genetics. Um, but um, I think a lot of it does come down to that. So how well uh, the cultivation of a strong spirit could work in someone who's got quite poor genetics and has inherited certain diseases and stuff or disorders um physically um how well that would work for them because maybe they're just going to be slightly weaker anyway uh, and susceptible to more things anyway so therefore they wouldn't prolong their life however i would say in certain people and if you are dedicated to life and dedicated to that overcoming your fears and all the rest of it they will it will physically reduce uh, certain stress chemicals, stress hormones, etc. And that means that you're going to be less susceptible to illness and stuff like that. Um, and and that may have some impacts on um, your kind of ability, your like longevity, essentially. Uh, and this is why, like, some people... And this is really why, to, to end as well, um, why all of the Jungians lived so long. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that? Where you look at the Jungians, Joe Wheelwright, uh, Jane Wheelwright, Anelia Yaffe, um, Liliane, uh, uh, Marie, Marie Louise on Franz, uh, Jung himself, uh, C.A. Meyer, all these names, loads and loads of names. And you look and you look and you look at all these people. Uh, James Hillman, 85. I can tell you all the ages of these people when we died. 
Um, um, Marie Louise on fans was 83. Uh, Joe Wheelwright was, I believe, like 93. Jane was like 98. Uh, C.A. Meyer was 95. Young was 85. Um, all these people, you know, um, Lillian, I think it was like 90, 91. Something like that. Like 1991. Uh, Anelia Yafwe was again like 90. Um, all these people who were very zen, who had overcome all these fears, who had been around young, who had gained individuation in a way that was far transcended of many people before them. Um, they all lived over 80, a lot of them over 90. Um, and you can go through and you can look, if you go back in the Jungian tradition and you look at all those first generation of analysts, you'll see that there wasn't many who who died really below 80. Really, And it's weird that is, isn't it? Because they knew, you see, they knew what I've been explaining in this video. They knew that the way to secure in longevity is through a strengthened spirit. Now, it would be quite ironic, wouldn't it, if I die at about 45 um, from some sort of illness, having said this and having proclaimed that uh, there are certain ways in which you might be able to, to prolong your life. But nonetheless, I think the irony, uh, certainly from the self's point of view, if we could ever categorise the self as, as having some sort of subjective consciousness of its own, watching the divine play go on... Um, it would be quite ironic from the self's point of view that 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 would be um, categorised as an experience within itself, within within the macrocosmic self, uh, and and I think there would be quite a, a, an interesting level of irony, not not necessarily from my egoic point of view, from my personal ego ego's view, because that would be a very bad prospect, really. But from the the more macrocosmic self, that would be quite an um, a uh, funny thing, because I always think as of humans really, from the self's viewpoint, if we're ever going to say there's some sort of subjective self, that it is they are vessels of humour, you know, and and vessels of living out um, its its play, you know, it's it's having a laugh. So all of these weird things that people die from, you know, people die of the most random, weird, almost hilarious ways. That is the self, you know, using, in a horrible way, basically, the individual, the human individual, literally creating a human individual to have this life and, and kill them uh, or, or play with them in their life in these horrible ways just for entertainment. And it's not that that's, you know, it's very, very tempting to say, well, that's like a... It's basically saying that the, the self is like a cat playing with a mouse. It's not, because what we've got to understand is that Brahman, the ultimate reality, um, you can even say Shiva or whatever, or Atom or the Rainbow Snake or whatever language, whatever religious conception you want, God, Wotan, Allah, whatever way you want to call it, it doesn't matter, it's all the bloody same, the universe, whatever. Um, it's... Uh, it's not because that is the person as well. The person is the universe. The person is the self. Um, but expressed and contained in a much smaller version of it, you see. In a differentiated, unbeknown to it kind of version of it. And then, of course, in individuation you, or, or in spiritual awakening, at least, on the process to individuation or, or like that wider, um, lifelong individuation, you get to understand it's not unbeknown to, to it really is it? it you are it and that's that and that's the the Upanishads you know that art thou and not tap the massy um and uh so so that is quite interesting and that is uh uh so it's not really that it's a cat playing with a, a mouse in a horrible way but rather that itself is playing with Sounds a bit wrong. I've, 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 I've talked about that before as well. I've said it in that exact way. It's itself playing with itself. Take that how you like it, but that's exactly how it is. Uh, and all of these manifestations of different varieties of, uh, are like... Uh, it's humour unto itself, basically, in, in a way. But anyway, I'll leave it there for this one, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I will go now. I'll go for a walk and then have some tea. You can see it's dark now. Um... 
and I will combine these two together and we'll see what sort of video comes out of it. Um, a very long one, a very intense one, no doubt. And uh, I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys. Bye for now.